thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, let me just introduce everyone. Uh, Stuart Butterfield, co-founder of Flickr, back in the first bubble. Was that a first bubble? A little bit post the first bubble. A little bit. For, he's, um, he uh, sold the company to Yahoo for less than his last round of funding for his current unicorn, which is Slack, right? Um, uh, Julie uh, Wainwright over here, who is the uh, CEO of The Real Real, which is a online fashion consignment firm, and she was also the CEO of Pets.com back in the bubble. And Bill Gurley, who I think is the tallest VC in the world, is that right? John Homer was an inch taller. Uh, an inch, so the tallest, in, in, the tallest on stage here, um, who uh, is a partner at uh, a Benchmark. So let me just take a show of hands, bubble or no bubble? Wait, Wait, which is, one is, is bubble my... up or no? Is there a bubble? Is there a bubble? Is there a bubble? There's a bubble. There's a, so no bubble. Yeah, no, it said on my PR briefing, you are being set up to be the poster boy of the no bubble. bubble. So <laughs> we want to be entertaining, right? All right, so let's just take a show of hands in the audience. Bubble, put your hands up. What would you say? That's about 50-50? All right, we'll do that again at the end and see, see how people have changed. <laughs> um, so Bill, uh, let's, let's start with you. Um, uh, one of the things um, when I've talked about bubbles and columns and stories and so on is um, uh, VCs usually come after me and call me really nasty names and it hurts my feelings a lot. Yeah. Um, but you're one of the few VCs that's out there that's saying there is a bubble, what makes you different? Well, I, I look at it this way. I, if I'm not out, you know, this isn't shot in Freud, I'm not looking to predict death or anything like that. Um, if I see what I view as unsustainable, unreasonable behavior that's going to lead to failure because of what I've seen in the past, then I feel it's kind of my responsibility to call it out. If you in a car heading over a cliff and I say, hey, slow down or turn left, that's being, prag you know, it's being a pragmatist, not being a doomsayer. And that's kind of what is behind my motivation. I fully recognize, let's say we're all at a bar and I'm the guy that's turning on the lights and saying, hey, it's last call, you should go home. You might Stuart, need to get, it's time to go home. You, you, might, you might need to get up early and work out. That's not nearly as much fun as the guy that busts through the door with a tray of jello shots that say, let's keep partying, <laughs> right? And that, that second one's a lot easier to do, but it actually leads to a kind of reinforcement of the bad behavior that takes you higher and higher and then the fall's bigger. But one of the things is you're, you're talking about bubbles and yet you're investing in unicorns that are grossly overvalued, that some people may say. <laughs> but do you, do, is it, aren't you getting it both look, ways? Look, we, you know, w another one of my firm beliefs is that when, when capital is remarkably accessible, it's a relative negative for the best entrepreneurs. Most of the great CEOs that I work with want this to stop because they're forced to play the game on the field. They have to react to what's going on in the market, whether it's hiring or whether a competitor might have you know, tripled the size of their sales force. You have to play. And great entrepreneurs raise money in any cycle, right? They can raise money in any cycle. So when there's less money available, the better entrepreneurs are advantaged. Got it. So can I ask? Yeah, of course. You know, when you say bad practices, what bad practices are you seeing? Well, look, some of it's being called out, like um, Chamath Palipatia talked about, you know, kind bars and exposed brick walls. Like he said, if you, if you go bankrupt because you, were, you tried and it didn't work, that's admirable. But if you do it because you need those things, you're an idiot, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and there's just practices like that. The, the, there was an article about the, um, the new CEO at Evernote, and, you know, they had home cleaning services for every employee. Like that. Yeah, I was just uh, uh, Julie and I were just talking that a lot of a lot of startup CEOs are taking private jets because I guess that's what you do now when you're. You know, I know of a, I know of a very well regarded startup which I'm not going to name. Come that, on. That, that's offering double comp to their salespeople in the first year wow. to get people away from other companies. Uber. No, no I'm not going to say. <clears> that. But it's those kind of things, and they get we get we get risk seeking slowly, we get risk averse quickly, and so it's a boiled frog kind of phenomenon. So, Julie, um, I'm just going to get this one out of the way. You've probably been asked this question 500 times. What made Pets.com the poster child of the last bubble? Well, I have two answers okay. to that. One is built an incredible brand. So even maybe, you know, I don't know how old you are, but I bet I'm a lot older. And I bet when the bubble was, the first bubble was around, you might have been in middle school. If that's yeah, probably close, close-ish. Close -ish. Anyway, high diapers, school, so. high school at least. Um, but the, you know, the puppet really. I was, was actually in college because oh. I, I worked in the in the first bubble, 
I made banner ads for about.com. Ah. And so I, and then I went and traveled around Europe with my winnings. So, so I mean, the puppet, that's great. It was good. Yeah. They were really cool little but ads. But the puppet was an iconic brand, and people remember the puppet. All right? So there's absolutely no doubt about that. Also, um, I was one of the first ones. I shut the company down and returned money to shareholders. I didn't run it to bankruptcy. Yeah. And we were still one of those companies that took a lot of cash, went public quickly. I knew I couldn't get the secondary done, so I shut the company down. And we, were, we had a lot of press going up. We had a lot more press going down. down. Yeah. So I think you know that and the fact that everyone said, you can't make money shipping pet food, but you fast forward 15 years and everyone's making money shipping things much heavier than pet food. So, True. but really when you just look at it, it was a high, it was also, uh, we were in a cluster of investment, which you're seeing still today, which yep. is why I say there's all kinds of signs of a bubble. When you, I think we were the first of eight pet companies funded simultaneously. But you had the best name. It, it, in any case, when you start seeing a lot of money chasing the same sector. Yeah. You're, it, the business is so splintered and it was so early. I mean, there weren't, there were 200,000. Well, we could say that about a lot of things that are going on today, but we'll, we'll get well, to Well, yeah, we'll but there, at that time, there were 200,000 people that in the inter, on the internet, you know, basically that you could reach on a regular basis. Yeah. And, and now we're in the billions. Yeah. I think worldwide, there were only 200 million on the internet, they were saying. So, you know, it was a different time, but um, it absolutely was a cluster for funding. Someone has a good idea and things, you know, get a lot of money floating around then too. And everyone's like, well, then we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Yep. And you c no one can compete in that scenario. So all three of you were, were around in the first bubble. Um, it's funny, actually, I, I say the first bubble. I, I said it recently at a dinner party and someone said, wait, this ha we don't know if this is a second bubble. That would be like introducing your wife and saying, this is my first wife and you haven't even gotten divorced yet. <laughs> um, <coughs> Uh, Odds are. <laughs> it's the first bubble. So you were all around in the, the, that bubble in 99. Um, tell us a crazy story, of, you know, Stuart, you start with, with something that happened that, was, that made you think, this is insane. Like maybe it was the time that you and Bill took his pink Ferrari to Vegas and threw a million dollar party for a startup or something like that. Do you, do you I have I wasn't any? In, in, in quite as a dramatic uh, position. But I do remember I, I hated my job. What were you doing? February 2000. I was the head of a design group at a company called Communicate.com mm -hmm. that owned a whole bunch of domain names. So this is, actually, this is a good example of the crazy. They, the founder of the company registered electronic.com and dance.com and keyboard.com, but also makeup.com and perfume.com. And in the thinking of the time, and this seemed natural, we own makeup.com. Revlon's a nice company, but makeup.com is a much better brand and yep. that would be true forever. So the fact that they had, you know, $8 billion company didn't make any difference. But I hated working there and I quit in uh, February 2000. So near the end of the month. So about two, two weeks, two and a half weeks before the crash. And I thought that I was walking away from $10 million and I got a check for 35,000 to get bought out. Oh really? 35,000 more than anyone else made who stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> and you? Oh, I've got two stories. One is um, I walked out of a board meeting once and my board members were beating me up because I wasn't spending money fast enough and I had a more cautious, measured approach. So that was one of those things I'm like, whoa. But the, my favorite one is there was a rush of people to join tech companies then. A lot of people were right out of college and a prominent professor from a prominent school back east called me and yelled at me because I didn't hire his student, who he said was a rock star. <laughs> and this person had two years of work experience prior to going to graduate school, and she wanted $225,000 a year. All right? And literally, the prof and I'm like, what? And, and there, is, there, is, there was a sense of entitlement of people coming into the workforce. I would say, absolutely, we're there again. We are absolutely Bill? there, and part of it's millennium, yep. you know, the millennials, but part of it's the fact that other companies give them things. The thing that always rubbed me the, the wrong way were fundraising parties. Like the fundraising parties? And then what do you, wait, party. fundraising parties. What yeah, you like you, you just closed around, so you throw, you a, throw party a big to party to celebrate the yeah. accomplishment, yeah. and that happened a lot back then. Yeah. I've seen a few of those recently here. It's, uh, ha raising, Did you guys yeah. have it Slack? Did Slack have a fundraising party? So valuations, people, people lose sight of this, but valuations represent discounted future expectations. They're not an award for what you've done in the past. Got it. And so 
if what, what people really should be doing when they raise a high round is it's like, oh shit, we've got, <laughs> we've got huge expectations in front of us. We got to deliver against, oh my God, we better get to work. Yeah. Instead of throwing a party. So, okay, let's just agree that there's a bubble. What's different now than, than, than the last time? Stuart, I'm going to let you start because you don't think there is one. So what's okay, different? Well, yeah, so I mean, this might be just a terminological debate because um, since 2008, we've been on an insane run in the public markets. Yep. Uh, I can very well imagine an environment where my company, Slack, is performing in exactly the same way, has the same growth, has the same amount of free cash flow. Every variable is the same, but we're valued at $1 billion instead of 2.8. So it could be that we agree. I think bubble is probably... Um, so you're, are you saying your company's overvalued? No. I'm saying I could also imagine a funding environment where it's valued at $4 billion. It, it, The question of what it's truly worth, I yeah. think, is... Um, so how do, this is, a, so this is a, a question I had a little later, but we'll get to this now. H how, I, I've never been able to understand this, and if someone can explain it to me, I, I would be really grateful. How do people come, how do you come up with the valuation of 2.8 billion? Why not just go straight to 30 billion? I mean, it's like, well, so it, I, I've had companies that come in, and, and I remember once when I first started reporting about this stuff in, uh, um, in the Valley itself, when I moved out here about four years ago, and, and there was a startup that came in, and I said, so what are you, what, you, what are you guys uh, worth? And they looked, the founders looked at each other, and, and they were like, I don't know, I think 20, maybe 30 million? I don't know, what do you think? And it's like they debated what they were worth in, in front of me, and that said 30 million. And it's like, where, where does it come from? Well, I mean, Julie can give our half, and then and yeah. Then I mean, Bill, the I side, mean, but... Bill's the money guy here. So, but how do you? But, but... It's, it's it's worth what someone's going to pay for it at this point, point. and exactly. that, by the way, is true in the public market as well. There's just a lot more people making that decision a lot more frequently. So, do you do you think that uh, when you look at the 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 companies that are out there um, today? I mean, I, I did a when I was writing this piece for Vanity Fair about the bubble. The one of the funniest things that I thought happened, I actually was going to bring the correspondence with the, the researcher from the article, but I, I'll just tell it to you. Um, when I filed the piece, there were about 68 unicorns. Um, and when we were started going back and forth with, the, with the, um, uh, the notes for the research, it had gone up to 75. And then when we went back again and it went to another editor, it was up to 80. And I was just backstage, you were saying it's 160. Yeah, I heard yesterday. 160. 160. So in a matter of a few months, we've literally gone 100 more unicorns um, wh I don't... Well, I mean, at, look, there was always numbers to justify anything because at some point, Bill has, everybody has somebody you answer to. I answered to my shareholders and my employees. He answers to the people that give him money. So everybody has somebody, so you have to have rationale on yep. how you get to those numbers. And it all makes sense at the time. It just may not make sense at the two years later or even one year later. So, you know, it's, there are real sound numbers to back up most investments when you are a professional investor, which is what, how Bill makes his living. When it comes to these um, people that want to get in in a deal, they're not setting the price. They're just participating. They're not doing due diligence. I mean, you know. But the, isn't that going to affect the entire market? Oh, well, it will. But, I mean, let, let's just assume 160, 80 of them are going to fail. I mean, Evernote obviously didn't, it couldn't make revenue. A lot of them are betting that revenue will be there. They're still audience aggregators. So at some point they have to prove it. You know, I might, Bill? and, but you know, at some point they have to prove it, but you know, 80 of them will fail. But the 80 that make it, the world's a different world than 15 years ago. So a bunch of rapid fire things. So one way it's way different than the last time is it's much more concentrated. We're giving much larger pools of money to much fewer companies in the last, in 99, a whole bunch of companies got a little bit of money. In this one, it's a whole bunch of money for, it, 163 is still relatively small compared to that. Stuart's exactly right. The prices are set when willing buyer meets willing seller. Like, and, and the difference from an IPO is, in this case, it's being set by one buyer, probably the highest price bidder. That doesn't work in an IPO because it's going to start trading publicly and you're going to get a more balanced average than you get here. So it tends to peg them up high. Um, I do think what you're hinting at is true, which is you have entrepreneurs seeking to get to that mark. 
And then you get into all these nuances about why private valuations aren't the same as public. You know, there's terms, you know, the protective terms. You can get your, if an, if an investor comes in and an entrepreneur is dead set on a number, they can build return into other terms and term up the, the term sheet and get to the valuation. And then lastly, you know, private valuations don't change. The press writes about them as if they're fixed. But there's been some press in the past few days where a, a, a public mutual fund was forced to write down their private ones. And if you study, you know, finance, like these are high beta plays. If the stock market's down 30 percent, you better believe that the vast majority of the unicorns are down 40. Um, <clears throat> talk about the differences, though, I think, because there yep. are some there are some yeah, the big differences. differences. So um, I think the most important among them for the, the biggest headline numbers, the biggest headline companies is that these are companies that are actually growing revenue incredibly quickly. So, I mean, you're on the board of Uber um, and several others. Uh, we see it in our own company. There was a lot of great ideas, I think, in, in 99, 2000, that were maybe 10 years too early because now, in, in 99, 2000, it was still two years before the Netherlands was the very first country to get more than 50% of its households connected to the internet on dial-up. So, you know, we're maybe yeah. two orders of magnitude, a larger market. Okay, but, but, I, but so I hear this all the time, right? right? Um, and, you know, one of my favorite lines that I've heard over the last year was um, the question of um, uh, quotes about, about this era of startups. San Francisco tech culture is focused on solving one problem. What is my mother no longer doing for me? Um, you have these food delivery services, these laundry delivery services. These, it's like literally like, mom, take me to soccer. Mom, pick me up from, go get my groceries. Mom, like I need my dry cleaning doing. Those are all the things that are out there today. There, the, there's two questions to this. Well, first, why do they exist, right? I mean, is it just for this, this, this tech culture in, in, in the Valley? But the second question is, you know, if you look in the United States today, eight out of 10 Americans eat at least two meals a week that are from McDonald's. They cannot afford to use 90% of these services. Are we just building these things because we have money here in Silicon Valley and in New York and LA and, and it's for a certain market? How, how is it going to continue to spread and help, help the rest of the country? If if there is a bubble means some investors will lose money yeah. on investments that they Wait, made. did you just say there then, is a bubble? No, if, if that's what we mean by bubble, then sure. I mean, then the opposite of a bubble is all investors will make money on all of their investments. I mean, that would, the second definition seems a lot more like a bubble. People will definitely lose money. The public markets will definitely go down at some point. You know, I'm 42, so I was born in 73. That's stagflation. Father was a real estate developer, so like every real estate developer in the world went bust in 1982 when interest rates went to 17%. I graduated from high school in 1991. No one got a job in the, the worst local recession in yep. a decade on either side. I worked through the dot-com crash. I literally, me personally, held Lehman Brothers over that weekend. So I'm very aware that there's a cycle, and there is a cycle, and there will be a correction. We've had an unbelievable seven years, and speaking of entitlement, we've had, you know, we have employees who started their career in 2008, 2009. So they've never known anything but their career advancing and at the same time this market going crazy. So they're like used to 20 or 30% annual raises. So there's all kinds of things that will, be, that will be corrected. Is it built on nothing? Like is this like tulips? That's what I, I don't agree with. I, don't, I think that there will be a number of great companies that survive this far more than survived 2000. Like they, there was eBay, Yahoo, Amazon, uh, Google. But will any of those companies be the next eBay, Amazon? I mean, oh, Uber, sure. obviously, but, but... Oh, sure they will. The sure real, real? I mean, you know what? Here's the other thing. People um, got a dose of what can happen if you don't own a market worldwide with the Somers brothers and we're, that are copycatters everywhere, all yeah. right? So what, when you look at what Uber's doing, they don't want to be copycatted. They're going to be big worldwide as long as the as long as their investors reward top line growth and fuel the losses and the lawsuits, they're going to be around. Yeah. And and they're going to be big and they're going to be worldwide and it'll, and you know and it's going to be a rocky road I suppose at some point if they ever have to get their PNL in mind and they run out of capital, but they're going to be around. App, there's not that many that you can point to that say can justify their valuations. But, but that doesn't mean that they have to for five years. And in five years, maybe they can. Hey, one real quick, quick thought related to what Stuart was talking about, about there being real revenues. I think it's important for people to keep in mind that we've relaxed this constraint of profitability in such a large way. And if, if two sets of uh, companies are given a goal of getting to 100 million in revenues, one of them has to do it profitably, the other one can lose 40 million. 
The order of magnitude of difficulty between those two things is probably 10 to one, maybe 100 to one. And so that's a, it's dangerous just to assume that revenue is good. So Bill, um, you in July last year, you tweeted, arguing we aren't in a bubble because it is not as bad as 1999 is, is like saying Kim Jong-un is fine because he's not as bad as Hitler. Would you st still compare this bubble to Kim Jong, or would you upgrade it to Stalin or Mussolini? Or maybe downgrade it to just, Donald look, Trump? Look, a number of people that were arguing we aren't in a bubble just simply looked at a bunch of 99 metrics and said we're not there. But you can have earthquakes of 9.0 or 8.0 or 7.0. They all suck. Um, and so <laughs> I, I just think it's the wrong, wrong argument. Twitter is down from $40 billion to $17 billion. Yelp is down. Groupon's down. Evernote's exploding. CB Insights says that uh, one notable startup dies each week. Uh, while it's not 1999, Stuart, it doesn't seem like it's situation normal to me. Am I wrong? Uh, I mean, I guess it, this might just be a semantic argument, but companies die all the time. I just tweeted, we're talking about people's tweets, um, a week and a half ago or something like that, the Dow components in 100 years ago, 1915. So like central rubber and US leather and US sugar refining co and stuff like that. So there is a cycle. Um, there's also some bad investments. There's some bad companies and, and bad decisions were made. And I think there's plenty of companies on that list. Twitter, I think it's a good example. But if you listen to Dick kind of plaintively uh, cry out to the world and to to the company that we went from seven bucks a share to 15 bucks a share and then very temporarily spiked to 45 bucks a share was that real like you know when that happened over the course of 10 days and then it came back down again yeah oh, you know people will anchor to the higher price and then they'll compare oh it was here and now it's here on the other hand if you look at the line you know people give twitter a lot of shit excuse me people give twitter a lot of uh criticism it's a <laughs> It's a 15 or $20 billion dollar company that. that didn't exist nine years ago. So like, yeah. oh, that's, that's a spectacular <laughs> failure. What a bunch of dopes, you know, like crazy. What, uh, $2 billion in revenue and, and yeah. on pace to double for the next year? Like, it's just yeah, it's so crazy. 100%. Yes, it was temporarily higher and it went down. And, and the same thing will happen in the public markets and the same thing will happen to lots of companies. And like I said, there would be funding environments where we'd be valued less. There's funding environments where we'd be, we'd be valued more. But the valuation, it, it's, there's a willing buyer, but it's a willing buyer because someone thinks, you know, there's decent odds that this could 5x, there's okay odds that this could 10x at the outside, maybe this could 100x. And so I'm, wait, so, yeah. so you, said, you, you said in an interview with a colleague of mine, Farhad Manju, in, in April, um, I've been in this industry 20 years, this is the best time to raise money ever. It might be the best time of any kind of business in any industry to raise money for all of, in all of the history, like since the time of the ancient Egyptians. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, stand by that. were you around then? Yeah, or, uh, do you, I mean, you stand by that? Is it? Is it? Uh, so, there's uh, an element of hyperbole in that. So I wasn't around when <laughs> really? people were investing in efforts to develop a chronometer to you know in the 18th century and, and stuff like that. Certainly, in the course of my career, this is the easiest it's been to raise money. I'm in a very lucky position because we've done really well. Um, yep. We're we're extremely high growth and things look rosy. So it's very easy not just to achieve a specific valuation or yep. achieve specific terms, but just to wrap the whole thing up. Yep. I mean, like the fundraising cycle is- Are you, are you raising right now again? No. Okay. All right, we're gonna go to a Q and A. So there's two microphones, one on the left, one on the right. Um, and uh, please come on up and ask questions to our wonderful guests about the bubble or no bubble. Bubble. I think we're kind of all in agreement that there is one. Yeah. Do we hide our, oh. our money under the mattresses or like? <laughs> so you went, you went to the bubble side, Stuart? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll come yeah. back after this. All right. Hi. Um, so what if it's not a bubble and it's a balloon? Bubbles have to burst. Balloons, you could let the air out slowly. Is there a way that the market can correct itself without it being a pop? I'll take a first crack. I think what Bill said earlier that um, risk aversion um, dissipates slowly. You said, you said the opposite, but um, and then comes on really quick. So it's hard to avoid that. On the other hand, um, when we had the Mark and Dreesen clip, I think one thing, I don't know that you would agree or not, a, a very small percentage increase on a huge enough market can count as a bubble. So the housing market in 2008, the market for VC investments, all of them put together is... 2% of, um, uh, of the US public market. So it's a very tiny and, and not even, you know, it's basis points of the whole GDP. So it's not really big enough to have an impact that's global. I think when you look at the investors that are investing later stage, that it will create 
a lot of disruption in their lives, but it's not going to have the unilateral effect that the 1999-2000 bu bubble. I, don't, I just don't see it being that. What's going to happen, though, is at some point people are going to want people to get to profitability, and the unit economics are going to be at odds with growing the revenue, and you're going to see companies struggle and lay off, but it's not going to have the same impact. Bill? Um, so the amount of money that's gone into late stage I don't think is calculated properly because it doesn't include all the hedge funds. There's money that's come from pools that are way outside what we've ever seen before. So some people think we've gone from 20, 20, 20 to 30. I think it's probably closer to 40 or 50. So the numbers get a little bit bigger, but Stuart's right. The, the thing that can make it super catastrophic is when you infect other industries. So um, let's take a look at, at the uh, DraftKings FanDuel thing. There's no way network television revenues are not being impacted by money losing venture dollars there. And so you start to see this infection that's spreading outside of Silicon Valley that can make it worse. I hope to God we can have a soft landing, which is why I've been so outspoken. But history would suggest it doesn't work that way. So is there any action specifically that you as VCs can do to help that happen? Well, but I, I, other than, than, than try and talk about it in a way that's ineffective, I'm not sure. Um, well, I think, I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think that VCs should be a little bit more responsible, in my opinion, um, about this. I mean, you know, uh, if Mark Andreessen wants to say situation normal, there are a lot of people that put money into, into Groupon Yelp and other companies that, that in their retirements and so on that have been affected by it. Yeah, and it's, it's not just the VCs, because it's the right. mutual funds, yeah, the absolutely. endowments, yep. the sovereign wealth funds. These are the, these are the big pools of people capital are being affected that, and will are, be affected. that are setting this marginal price. Tim Ferriss. Hey, buddy. How are you? I'm doing well. Nice Good. to see everybody. Uh, this is a question mostly for Bill, I suppose, although anyone's welcome to chime in. Of the participants who are investing in tech currently, who should keep doing it and who should stop? Wow. <laughs> Good question. What types of investors? Well, I, I, rather than, I don't know if I could classify them, I just, it, Julie had mentioned the notion that people aren't actually doing the due diligence. I agree with that 110%. People aren't looking at unit economics. These these financials aren't audited. It's like, don't do something just because you think you're getting in. You know, it's kind of that Madoff thing, right? Where you think you're getting in on something because you're invited. If you're being invited right now, you're the last call, not the first call, all right? <laughs> and, and so have that mindset. And I think the more people that have that pragma pragmatist mindset, the better off we are. If, if there, sorry, just to add on to that. Are there any other characteristics or things that the best in your mind are doing besides that due diligence? I, I, or I got in some trouble for talking about this, but look, as, as we get more risk seeking, we take on business models that are, that are more challenging. So the venture industry starts doing things with lower and lower margins, lower and lower unit economics. Those have to be even better to succeed, you know? Thank you. Ben. Hey, Nick. Uh, so we're talking a lot about bubbles, and I think the big thing when we're talking about that is which companies are live or d will live or die. So what I want to do is just ask you all is like list a couple companies and just raise your hand if you think it'll still be around for 10 years. Would you all be game to that? <laughs> I'm in. I, all right. Nixon. Nixon. You and Nick, can, can, Nick, can, you can, Nick can do that. Yeah. It's too late. I'm already here. Do it. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> we'll all raise start, our. Let's start easy. Uber will still be around 10 years from now. Oh, yes, absolutely. Around. Slack. I don't know. I don't know. Sure, Only, sure. It, Twitter. it may have been bought by Uber, Twitter. and it could be the, the user. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, these things may morph, but there's... All right, you have one, one more. <laughs> one more. Google? Uh, Spotify. Mm, I'll say yes. Mm. Interesting. Right, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Lyft? How about Lyft? What do you, you guys think, easy. Lyft? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Says the board, the guy. Uh, we, we have Ron Conway here with a question. I'm a little nervous now. Yeah, uh, Bill, you said that you know lately a lot of sovereign wealth funds, mutual funds, hedge funds have come into the market. I think they'll be the first to stop funding, and they've probably fleed the market already, and we don't realize it. <laughs> Do you think this will cause companies to have to go back to the old-fashioned IPO market? Yeah. And will <clears throat> that be a good thing? Um, my, my quick answer would be yes and yes. Um, I think there's been a, 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 
kind of imaginary myth that stay private longer is a good strategy. And when you, you know, one of the people that was most outspoken at being anti-IPO was the founder of Evernote. You can do a Google search, you'll find five articles where he says, oh, we don't ever want to be public. Well, if you want to maintain household cleaning and, and you know, 10 varieties of kind bars, then you probably don't want to be public. But <laughs> that's not how you build long-term sustainable businesses. So I do think so, that so what happen. So what ha so going off that question, what happens to these companies that are unicorns that are not going to go public? Where, where, how does this well, end? Well, I think you've already seen a couple exits. I mean, I think at one point Fab had a... Yep. Valuation over a billion, over a billion or dollars. yeah, and then they were sold for fifteen million to another company. So you know, if they can still exist, but investors got you know they got really a big big washout if anything. So they can if they, if they have a proposition that adds value, they'll find another home. But that doesn't mean people won't lose money all the way around. Do you think we'll start to see some of these nineteen ninety nine like uh, Stewart? Um, you know where that's you know the the. Well, it won't be Brian Williams because he doesn't really do that for a living anymore. But somebody like him who does uh, news for a living um, will go and say, you know, we'll see the video of, of them selling the the the, must, the pink mustaches from Lyft on, in, you know, or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. Will we see? Will we see that again, or is it going to? You know, I, it'll, we'll see what happens and, and how how big the change is. But uh, Uber's fifty billion. It has. 6,000 employees, 5,000 employees, something like that. So there's not room for 361,000 layoffs like we saw in that clip from- But the there are people that work for Uber. This is, the, you know, this is another- Oh, thing yes, yes, to. indirectly. Yes. There are people that work for, I mean, I think that's the thing. It's, you can play with the numbers and say, well, there's only 6,000 people that work there, but there are hundreds of thousands of people that are reliant on jobs from these companies in the sharing economy that will be affected if, if something happens. And I'm, I'm certain that, a higher percentage of employees in Silicon Valley are working for money losing companies than any time since 99. I'm yeah. certain of yeah. that. I don't have the data, but I'm certain yeah. of that. Yeah. 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 We have uh, one other question over here. Yeah, um, I found a unicorn a few years ago, about 20 hours what from did it look like? going public. <laughs> um, any advice? What was the first part what of it? What was the first part? Uh, I founded a unicorn about six oh. years ago. 20 hours were going public. This was pure storage. What advice do you have? for what's gonna happen in 20 hours. In 20 hours? Oh, no. yeah, I don't know. That'd be tough. Well, look, I, I, as, as Ron was hinting at, I, I do think that, that pretending that you never have to go public or never have to be scrutinized in that way is, is not a good way to think about the world. So, and I also think, by the way, that it's very hard. For, I think companies getting through that window is, is a rite of passage and an accomplishment. And so I, I, I think it's great that the company's pushing that way. I do think that we're about to face a, a wind change where the public market investors are going to want more profitability than we've had in the past. Well, I, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm I actually I'm, I'm more fearful now that we're in a bubble after this conversation. So, Stuart, you did not do a very good job convincing us <laughs> otherwise. But thanks thank you Nick. very much. Thanks, Nick. Thank